Welcome home, my child, well done. What words we all long to hear someday, do we not? Welcome home, my child. I tell you, this book of Malachi, it's really challenged me. The theme has been all in, and I have to be honest. There's some areas I've had to look at Stan Steele, and I've had to say, dude, you're not all in here. I've had to do some changes. I've had to do some things and said, Lord, I want to be all in. I've had to learn that gift of repentance kind of over again. I've had to really look within myself to say, Stan, what areas do you need work in? Who's been here for the whole series of Malachi? Anybody learned anything? Have you learned that we are a questioning people? Have you learned that? And I want to go over the six questions that is going to take us up to today's seventh question and the last question in the book of Malachi. If you'll remember, chapter 1, verse 2, the very first verse of Malachi, which is the messenger. Malachi is bringing the message to the Israelites after they've been out of exile. And he says, I'm going to tell you something that the Lord has put upon my heart. The Lord says, I have always loved you. Now, it wasn't good enough for them to say, awesome, the Lord's always loved us. They had to say, really? How have you loved us? Chapter 1, verse 6. God said to the priests, now these are the priests. This went with the other people as well. But the priests, the ones in authority, God said to them, a child will honor his father. A servant will honor his master. Well, I am both a father and a servant, and yet you do not honor or respect me. Their response, how have we not shown honor to you? In what ways have we disrespected you? And he answers, if you'll remember, he says, well, first of all, by unclean offerings. They didn't take the Lord at his word. That wasn't good enough. So they said, well, how are they unclean? How are they unclean? See, they didn't realize what they were doing was against God, and he had to knock on their heads a little bit, and they still questioned. Chapter 2, verse 17, God says, You have tired me with your words. They didn't just take him at his word. They said, Well, how have we tired you? Chapter 3, verse 7, You have been disobedient to me. You have been disobedient in my teaching and in my words to you. Return to me. Their response was, well, how do we return to you? And then last week, boy, last week was one of them really tough, get into your wallet type messages. God states, you are robbing me. Their response was, how are we robbing you? I hope everybody took a little look into last week's lesson and thought to yourself, am I robbing God? Am I going against the scriptures and the teaching? And that's part of being all in. It's not just parts. It's all. It's all. And so that brings us to the seventh question that we're going to be looking at today. And we will be in Malachi chapter 3, starting with verse 13. So turn in or turn on to your Bibles. To Malachi chapter 3, verse 13. And it says, You have said terrible things about me, says the Lord. Now in the NIV, it would say you have said arrogant things about me. In the English Standard Version, it would say you have said harsh things about me. King James Version uses that word stout or strong. So all of these together, you're arrogant, you're harsh, you're strong against me. But you say, what do you mean? What have we said against you? There's that question again. It seems to be a constant struggle to accept God's word. You see, it's a weakness of the heart. It's a flaw in trusting the Lord God Almighty. So let's find out what the charge was against them. These can be found in verses 14 and 15. And it says, You have said, What's the use of serving God? What have we gained by obeying His commands or by trying to show the Lord of heaven's armies that we are sorry for our sins? Verse 15. For now on we will call the arrogant blessed. 
For those who do evil, they get rich. Those who dare God to punish them, they suffer no harm. So that was the charges against them. Now we're going to focus on this group today, and I'm going to call them the arrogant or the grumblers, the complainers, or in your listening guide, we're going to call them the self-centered. So that's the first thing in your listening guide is the self-centered. What this means is they were saying, it's all about me. Now they weren't directly shaking their fists at God, but in secret, they were complaining to one another. And imagine this, God always hears. He isn't deaf as we sometimes like to think that he is. He knows all of our thoughts and he hears all of our words. So their complaint was simple. Why serve God? What do we get out of it? What do we gain? The arrogant, they seem to be blessed. Have you ever looked at your neighbor and thought, well, these people over here, they don't go to church on Sunday mornings. I don't even know if they know the Lord. But look at all this stuff they have. Why don't I? I serve God. Why doesn't God allow me to have all this stuff? We say that the evil get rich, and those who dare God to punish them, they suffer no harm. Have you ever wondered why things never happen to a non-believer? It seems like they've got it great. Well, let me tell you, when you ask why serve God, it's very, very dangerous territory. It's very dangerous. You see, we lose sight of eternal prosperity. We want to focus on earthly prosperity. What can we gain? We want to keep up with the Joneses. Well, see, these are very, very harsh words against the Father, and he pointed that out to them. So the first characteristic we're going to see today of the arrogant, the complainers, the self-centered, in your listening guide, they were sitting in judgment against God. Rather than submitting to his dealings with them, they were sitting in judgment against God. In their complaining and their grumbling over the circumstances they had received, they were actually elevating themselves above God. Does this sound familiar today? I think it does. Now, the Bible often refers to the faithless complaining as grumbling. You're going to hear that word today, as grumbling. And it warns us not to do it. Grumbling complaints against the Father declares that God is not sufficiently good, faithful, loving, wise, powerful, or competent. Real quick, just jot down these uh, scriptures. Numbers 14, 26 through 30. Philippians 2, 14. And James 5, verse 9. You can go back and read what the Bible says about grumbling. You can go back and read and see the warning signs of the complaining. But then they say, but the guy who arrogantly defies you is living a happy life. And then we get this attitude. We say, I would th fix this problem if I were in charge. Man, what an arrogant attitude to bring before the Father. To think that somehow I could do a better job running the universe than my Lord God Almighty. Is that not arrogant? Is that not harsh? Is that not terrible towards the Father God Almighty? But isn't it in our nature to complain and to grumble? Let's go back to the Israelites. Here was a people that was held bondage, held in servanthood to Egypt, and they were delivered. So what happens? They go out and they wander in the desert a little bit, and their hearts start to become complainers. They say, ha! Here we are, we're wandering in the desert. I think we should go back to Egypt. At least there, we had a dwelling place. We had food. We had water. And one of the greatest miracles that from you learn from the time that you're a child, the parting of the Red Sea. The Israelites complained, what are we going to do? Here come the Egyptians. Moses said, trust. The sea was parted. They walked through. And once again, their enemy was destroyed. 
That should have been testimony enough right there to say, I am all in with what I have just been seeing. I'm all in. But did they? No. They wandered around. And here came the, the part where they said, hey, we have no water. We have no food. They were given their provisions by God. And yet, after a while, hey, this manna, it's getting old. It's getting boring. Where's the hamburgers? Where's the tacos? Where's the spaghetti? So he gives them quail. And eventually, it becomes a stench in the earth from their complaining. It just seems that it goes on and on and on. We are never happy. You see, complaining about our circumstances, it's really questioning God's character. We're saying if God loved us, then we wouldn't be in difficult times or places in our lives. We are saying that I know what's best for me even more than my Creator. That brings us to point number two about the arrogant complainers. They had self-centered attitudes. Self-centered attitudes. They were simply asking, what's in it for me? Now be careful here because the flesh is inclined to self-pity, self-focus, and self-centeredness. And the world feeds this. It is always, what's in it for me? What can I gain? What can I prosper? If there's nothing in it for me, then why do it? you got to be careful. If a church isn't meeting your needs, we bail out. You deserve some happiness. You can't worry about the needs of others. God understands your needs come first. That's what we may say. But we need to be careful about how we present the gospel. If we approach it as, come to Jesus and he will meet all your needs, then we aren't giving the full picture. Now it's true, of course, that Jesus satisfies the deepest longings of every heart that trust him. But God is not Aladdin's genie. He isn't there to grant your every wish. So while following Christ brings us a deep and lasting joy, the path to that joy is daily self-denial and surrender. I'm going to say that again. It is daily self-denial and surrender. That is how we gain prosperity. And it's not an easy thing. It's not a pleasant thing. We have to be all in. It has to be full surrender. What's in it for you if you serve the Lord? Well, He gives abundant blessings, both in this life and in eternity. But don't forget about persecutions. Now, this is a tough thing in today's society. All who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. And this is what happens when you face a little persecution, when you get made fun of a little bit. Self-centered people, they don't last long in serving God. They go the other way. So I ask you today, are you in it for self-service? Or are you in it for Christ? servant? It's a question you need to ask yourselves. The third thing that we see about the confused and the lost and the complaining and the arrogant and the grumblers, the ones that say terrible things, they lost their motivation for holy living. Righteous living and obedience, to them it had become boring. They were saying, well, where's the joy of living? Where's the fun? This religion stuff, it's a drag. Their hearts were not God's. They were going through the motions, but it meant nothing. Their devotion was gone. The love was gone. Now, motivation and attitude are everything when we obey and when we serve. Even in life, this is very important for God. Our motivation and attitudes are everything when we obey and serve God. I want to give a couple examples of that. 
My father-in-law, the last two or three years of his life, he became ill. He became to where he needed help from family. He needed that extra dose of love and care. Now let me tell you about the attitude and motivation. It could have became a grumbling thing to say, ah, oh, my father-in-law fell. I have to get up and I have to go care for him. But when I turned it on and said, my father-in-law, he needs me. My father-in-law needs the love and the care. My attitude became positive, And it was a servanthood to him. And he loved us for it. There was no grumbling. Now, don't get me wrong. Some days it was 2.30 in the morning and Cheryl had to get up. And it was like, ah, something's happened to dad. But in the end, it was the service that she gave. That gave the proper motivation in the servanthood. And I have to try this every morning, and it works, believe me. Who grumbles every Monday morning when you have to get up for that job? Who grumbles? Come on, hold up hands, admit it. Okay? Try this test, if you will. It says everything and all that we do, do to honor God. So when that alarm clock goes off, instead of grumbling and saying, Ugh, I have to go to work, try this. And it works. I've tried it. Test me. I've tried it. Just say, I get to go to work. God has given me this job because without this job, I have nothing. I can't pay my bills. I have no food. Attitude makes motivation either a servanthood thing or a complaining, grumbling thing. Just try it. I get to go to work. Sunday mornings, is there grumbling to come into the Lord's house? Or do we wake up and say, I get to go worship and praise my God with other followers. Just try it. It works. Believe me, it does. <clears throat> so this group, uh, also the next characteristics we're going to see about them, they were focused on the prosperity of the wicked. They had lost that eternal prosperity vision. They were focused on the prosperity of the wicked. They were saying, it's useless to serve God. And they were calling the arrogant blessed. They could see no reward in following God. They could only see the rewards for those who defied God and sought their own prosperity and their own wealth. We forget God's eternal plan and focus on the world's, do we not? That's a danger. That's a danger. We're so concerned with others. See if this sounds familiar. The one with the most toys win. Who has more? Who has nicer things? Who's got the money? Who's got the nicer car? Who's got the nicer motorcycle? Who wears the nicer clothes? Who's got the bigger house with all the luxuries inside? Who? Well, if I can be harsh... The wicked. And I'll tell you why. Because those possessions, if they take place before serving God, it's a sin against our Father. And that's arrogance towards our Father. It's a terrible thing to be that way. Anyone ever been to a funeral? Yes. I got to thinking about this today. When that hole is buried and that casket is lowered down into the ground... I don't recall a big hole being dug over here next to that casket final resting place and they start throwing the cars and the bicycles and the monies and the boats and the kayaks and the clothing. They don't throw any of that in there with that person. You mean the person leaves the world with none of his stuff? Absolutely, because prosperity on this side of the grave, it's pretty useless because you don't take it with you. I'm more focused on my prosperity and my gifts when I draw my last breath. And the thing about that is, I don't know when that time's going to come. Jesus could come before that. I don't know, but I want to be ready. I don't want to lose sight of my eternal prosperity by focusing on the earthly prosperity. 
I want to serve God and I want to be in the right frame of mind to do so. So that takes care of our arrogant, our complainers, our grumblers, the self-centered. We're going to focus now on group number two. I've titled this The Faithful Few. If you want to write that in your listening guide, The Faithful Few. These are the ones who fear and honor God. In spite of hardships, they still serve. We're going to be reading in verse 16. And it says, Then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other, and the Lord listened to what they said. Now we're going to get on to the second part of verse 16 in just a minute, but I want to stop right there. As we mentioned before, the Lord listens. He hears all. He knows all. Now this second group which is a group that I hope that we are all in today, they would be considered the minority. They were fewer in numbers. We see that today. It seems that the godly are outnumbered by the other various groups. How about politics? How about our school system? How about our workplace? How about friends and family? We seem to be outnumbered for our service to the Lord Jesus Christ. We've already talked about there's mockers out there, there's scoffers, there's the ones who persecute. What well, can I tell you? Hold the faith one of these days to listen to them words, well done, my good and faithful servant. <clears throat> always be faithful because God is always faithful to those who serve, even in the hard times. And we had a little prayer meeting this morning uh, got one of our church members that's going through a rough time right now. But I tell you, this person has the heart of a servant. And although we may be a little bit worried sometimes as humans, the Lord's got it. And we told her, we said, you're going to be fine. The Lord has this. Don't lose sight of what's ahead by worrying about what's right now. Because God has it. God has it. And he has it all the time. He's got tomorrow already in hand. Don't worry about tomorrow. Now this second group, they were called righteous. As to where group number one, they were called wicked. Now that's not saying that by serving God, it earns us this name tag that says righteous, righteous one, worthy one, holy one. It's because we can do nothing to commend ourselves to God. It's through our Lord Jesus Christ who gives us that gift of God's grace through faith. But serving God is a sign of a righteous person. Where those who do not serve God show a wicked spirit and they live for themselves. And folks, there's only two groups. There's only two. Group one, they do not trust Christ or serve him, and they live for themselves. Group two, they are justified by faith in Christ Jesus, and they live to serve him. So let's look at some of the characteristics of the few, the faithful few. We already established those who fear and honor God's name. That's in your listening guide. That was at the first part of verse 16. Kendall, if you could put that up there again. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other, and the Lord listened to what they said. You see, he's our father. And like our earthly father, there should be respect and fear, and yes, trembling. Fear and trembling. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, Paul mentions, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you the desires and the power to do what is pleasing to him. In Psalms chapter 2 verses 11 and 12 it states, serve the Lord with fear and trembling. Now this is not that element of surprise fear. Of someone walking into the kitchen or boo, you know, whatever that may be. Or the snake, if a snake crawled across here, guys, I'm, I'm out. I'll just tell you that right now. I'm gone. You won't see me. It'll be just a flash. But this is the fear in dealing with our Heavenly Father of when we've done wrong. We don't want to disappoint. It's a fear of the punishment. 
And it keeps us in line with what is right. It's that fear of the punishment. It's not a disownment, and I'm going to use my parents. When I was younger, and I knew that I'd done something wrong, I knew that mom and dad, one of them was going to get a hold of me and shake me around a little bit. But I never once worried about needing a place to live or that they was going to kick me out of the family. But that fear also told me, man, that didn't feel good. I didn't like that. So what did it do? It helped me to stay on the right path. It helped me to do what I knew was right. That's the fear that we're talking about, our Heavenly Father. I don't want to disappoint my Heavenly Father. I don't want to disappoint my Heavenly Father. And that fear keeps me in line from not disappointing the Father by doing what is right. Do I fail? Yes, I do. But that's where the gift of repentance comes in, and that's where my Father says, I love you. It's been forgiven. Let's, let's move on. Let's not do it again. <clears throat> the second part of that, the ones that uh, honor his name, we could kind of call this the early edition of the Lord's Prayer, a prayer that we've all said. We know that. The first part of it is, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now that word hallowed, it means to keep holy. It means to set apart. It means to place it on its own platform. There's nothing or no other name that is as great. It's holy, 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 Lord, God Almighty. That's what the ones who feared and honors his name, that was the attitude that they took. They honored that name of Jesus Christ. They honored that name of holy God. They had that fear that kept them on the right path. We also learned in that first part of verse 16, in your listening guide, they encouraged and they spoke to each other. You know, in life, it's so important to find like-minded persons, people that we can confide in, people with the same beliefs, people that we can build up, people that we can encourage as we go through our day. Now, these people here, their words to each other, they may have been in reference to service. You know, there could have been words like, keep up the good work, hold on to your faith, love the Lord your God, love others. Serve both. Have you heard that motto before? <laughs> love God. Love people. Serve both. That's one here at Northwest that you hear a lot of. They were probably saying to one another, you know, don't listen to the scoffers. Once again, that's the ones who make fun of you. That's the ones that mock you. They were probably saying, don't give up serving God. Because there is... A reward. And we're going to get into that reward now at the end of verse 16. So, Kendall, if you could put verse 16 back up there, please. The last part of that verse says, well, we'll just read the whole thing. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other, and the Lord listened to what they said. Here's the second part. In his presence, a scroll or a book of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him and always thought about that precious name of God. Now that last part of verse 16, if you'll notice, we are told something very interesting. Those who feared the Lord, the Lord took note of. The picture seems to be that when God revealed that they were speaking harsh words against them, then those that feared the Lord and talked with each other and responded appropriately to Him, there was a clarification here. When they responded to what God said, then God took notice, and those who paid attention, their names were written in a book of remembrance. This word says scroll. It was written down. It was documented. A name was written. Now, the Scripture shows that God has a book, and this picture goes all the way back to Moses, when the people sinned, against God with the golden calf. Moses himself pleaded with the Lord to forgive the people. 
Moses even put himself on the line as the intercessor. He tells the Lord, he says, Lord, please forgive them. And if you don't, erase my name from that book. That's found in Exodus chapter 32, verses 32 and 33. And here was the answer to Moses from God Almighty. God's answer to Moses was, no, no. I will erase the names of everyone who has sinned against me. You want your name written in that book? By golly, I think that everybody should. In Revelations chapter 20, verse 12, and then also in verse 15, it says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. The books, it's plural, the books were opened. It's plural. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Verse 15, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. I think I want my name written in the books, do we not? The point is that God has a book in which names and actions are written. Names and actions are written. So God is telling us that our righteousness is not wasted. It is not pointless to serve the Lord. There is a book, and those whose names are not written in the book will experience eternal destruction. They will be thrown into the lake of fire. So there's that eternal prosperity again. It's eternal riches or eternal destruction. And the two groups cause your fate in the end. And then the third characteristics that we see from those who fear and honor the Lord... They are especially noticed, and they are cared for by God. We'll be reading about that here very shortly, but we should remember that God hears and sees and remembers everything said by everyone at all times. God does not forget His children when we take a stand for Him or when we pay a price to serve Him. That's found in Hebrews 6, verse 10. So Malachi 3, 17 and 18 reads like this. They will be my people, says the Lord of heaven's armies. On the day I act in judgment, they will be my own special treasure. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Verse 18. Then you will again... See the difference between the righteous or the faithful few and the wicked, or as we've talked about, the harsh, the arrogant, between those who serve and those who do not. God promises that the righteous, serving children of God, those who fear and honor Him, will be His possession. They will be His possession. Treasure. And isn't treasure something that's always intriguing about we want to go find the treasure because it is so precious? Do you realize that that's how God looks at us? We are a treasure. <clears throat> he will spare them when he judges the earth as a man spares his own son who serves him. So God is assuring his people that he hears and takes notice of them that the world themselves overlook and despise. You see, the world, they notice the powerful, the rich, the famous. Do we not see that every single day? Turn on your televisions. Look what people are into. I tell you, God's not at the forefront of the world today. There's other things that's getting in the way. God notices those who fear and serve Him out of love. They are his special treasure, and we should not despair at the prosperity of the wicked or at our own trials. Folks, we have trials. Do not despair. It's in bigger hands. In our depression, our despair, it doesn't help the situation. 
There's nothing that we can do without God. When God judges the earth, the line between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not, it is made clear in that verse 18. 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We are all going to be judged. There is a day when the books are opened, and those who are not written in the book of life, they will be eternally judged. And this is something right here that should really scare a lot of people if they don't know where they're going. Pastor Paul will be preaching uh, this segment next Sunday, but I just want to touch Malachi 1. You will see in Malachi 4, verse 1, that there will be no other opportunity or no second chance when that day comes. This is it. This is it right now. This determines your fate. Do we serve or do we not? There is no root or branch that will be left once the judgment falls. But the gospel is that those who fear the Lord will belong as God's treasured possession, and He will spare His people. God says that there's a distinction that God is making as we looked at Malachi 3.18. The people are complaining that there's no difference between the righteous and the wicked. They are even saying that there's no point in serving the Lord. But God says that there will be a distinction. And you will see that distinction between the righteous and the wicked. You will see the distinction between the ones who serve and those who do not. This is an important point that Jesus himself made in a parable. If you want to turn to your Bibles to Matthew 13, 24 through verse 30. You can follow along. Matthew 13, starting in verse 24. Then he put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then they went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain... The weeds also appeared. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Then how does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest the gathering of the weeds you uproot the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bundle them to be burned. But gather the wheat and bring into my barn. See, we coexist with those that are not like-minded as we are. We coexist with the evil and the righteous. But the Lord says... The day of judgment, one group will be bound and burned. One group will be brought into the barn, which is heaven. What a beautiful picture. Once again, though, I think I want to be the ones that's serving God. <clears throat> Notice it looks like when God is doing nothing, God is waiting so that he does not uproot the wheat with the weeds. So here in Malachi, God says that there will be a distinction between the righteous and the wicked, because there is a day when God will act in judgment. All who fear and honor God are written in this book of life. You see, service to God and obedience and repentance, it gains us eternal prosperity with the Father. What a day that will be. See, serving God is vital. And in conclusion today, I've got five takeaways that I want to make very clear to this. And I've got, uh, got it written down here. It's in your listening guide that says to me. But uh, number one, the Lord listens to us.
the Lord listens to me. The Lord listens to Stan. That can be a spooky thing sometimes if my thoughts are not lined up. What I don't want God to hear. And there's no hiding from it. Our sin and repentance, if I know I've done wrong, the Lord knows I've done wrong. The Lord listens to me. I want my heart to be a serving heart. Have I failed? I have. But God's working on me. God works on that heart. And He listens. He knows my struggles. Even when I can't get the words out that need to be said, He listens. He knows. The second thing we see, the Lord remembers me. How? My name is written in a book. It's remembered. He says, Stan, it is documented. It's stamped right here. Seal of approval. Once my name has been written, it can't be erased. There's no eraser on that pencil. There is no eraser on that pencil. He remembers me. He remembers me. The third thing we see, he claims me. I am a child of God. A child of God. He claims me as one of his own. And let me tell you, I don't feel I'm worthy, but God does. And I'll tell you why. Because number four, he treasures me. He sees me as more precious than any jewels, any gold, any silver. See, he had that map with the X on it. And he went through, he found me in my hole, he dug me out of that hole, and he said, there is my treasure. And he claimed me as a child of God, a child of his own. The last thing we see is we've just talked about with uh, the wheat in the barn, he spares me. He spares me. He promises to spare us because God is just. We deserve justice. But because He is merciful, we don't receive what we deserve. In fact, we receive much more than we reserve. Do we not? I don't deserve what I've got in heaven that's going to be mine, my mansion, my crown. My opportunity to stand before the Father and worship and sing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all day. Those are the eternal gifts that I look forward to. It's called grace. And aren't you thankful that God did not spare His Son? He did not spare His own Son. Because he sacrificed him in my place. And I am now free. We are free. He spared his son for you. He spared his son for you. We are now free. Romans 8.32 says, He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? He will give us all things. So I want to pose a couple of questions this morning. What group are you in? Are you looking around complaining? Are you looking around saying, why should I serve? I get nothing out of it. Everybody else seems to have everything. I have nothing. Or are you looking up and understanding and comprehending what God says? As God eavesdrops in our lives, He makes a distinction between those who know Him and those who do not. We see this once again in that last verse of Malachi 3. You will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked. Between those who serve God and those who do not. The Bible makes it clear that there is no middle ground you're either in one of the two groups that we've talked about today. You're either a server 
or a complainer. You're either righteous or you're wicked. You're either saved or you're lost. You're either alive in Christ or dead to your sins. You're either in the light or you're in the darkness. You're either in the kingdom of the Son or in the kingdom of Satan. You're either on that road to heaven or you're on that highway to hell. You're either all in or you're not in at all. You're either fully surrendered or you haven't let go of those things that keep you from full service to God. So here's the question. What group are you in? I'm going to ask you all to stand right now at this time. If you're not sure what group you're in, let me encourage you to stop denying your guilt before holy God. Recognize that serving the Savior is the only thing that matters and come to grip with the fact that God is fair in all His dealings with us. It's time to look up and comprehend. It's time to look up and understand that God listens to you. God remembers you. God claims you as His own. God treasures you. God wants to spare you. God has done so much for us. Romans 2, 4 reminds us that we need to respond to His grace and His mercy in order to activate it into our lives. It says, Do you show contempt in the riches of His kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you towards repentance? Friend, allow God's kindness to move to your repentance today. I'm going to ask everybody to bow your head, close your eyes. Let the Lord work in you right now. Is there something in your life? Is there something you need repentance about? Come to the altar. And I want to go back to verse 16. Focus on this as we close. I want you to notice that once the people decided to exalt God and edify one another, they did something to help them remember their commitment. That scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. They put their names on that line. Will you commit yourselves right now to that task? And then will you publicly acknowledge that from this point on, you will serve the Lord until the end? Will you decide right now to repent, to obey, to honor, and to serve the Lord God Almighty? Are you all in today?